Good morning. I'm your host, Lenny Orlov with Seattle Human Services. Today's virtual civic coffee hour is presented in partnership with the Seattle Public Library as a way to encourage civic engagement among older adults in Seattle. Closed captioning is available in seven languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. To enable the captions, live or in a recording, click the CC under the video and then on the gear to the right of it to choose your language. Today on the Civic Coffee Hour, we will hear from Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin. Following the mayor's remarks, Anthony Derrick, digital advisor in the mayor's office, will collect some of the questions from the online Q&A and present them to Mayor Durkin. We will conclude with additional resources and upcoming events. To introduce Mayor Durkin, let me welcome Jason Johnson, Interim Director of Seattle Human Services. Jason, welcome to the show. Please remember to unmute your microphone. You are live on the Civic Coffee Hour. Great, Lenny, thank you so much. <clears throat> and uh, special thanks to the Age Friendly Seattle team for making today's Coffee Hour possible. Uh, good morning, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jason Johnson, and I have the great honor to serve as Director of the Human Services Department for the City of Seattle. It's truly my pleasure to join you today. Uh, the Human Services Department mission is to connect people with resources and solutions during times of need so that we all can live, learn, work, and take part in a strong, healthy, safe, thriving community. It is uh, wonderful to work every day with a dedicated team of human service professionals and also in close partnership uh, with a mayor who is a, has a strong commitment to uh, human services and the Human Service Department's goals. These civic happy hours, one way that the Human Services Department helps to connect people, have grown each month. And thanks to modern technology, this virtual format uh, has allowed us to offer not only closed captioning in English, but viewers, uh, as Lenny stated, have a choice of six additional languages. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just offer a special thanks to Seattle Public Library for partnering with the Human Services Department and the Age Friendly Seattle team uh, this year on programs that help older people learn about city programs and services. The library always has been a place people could count on to get answers to questions, including phone, email, and online chat with a librarian, which are especially critical these days while library branches are closed. Library books and materials are available through curbside service, and the library offers amazing online resources, including upcoming classes on Medicare. Uh, you can visit spl.org uh, for more information, and thank you again to the Seattle Public Library for your partnership. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's special guest, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin. I'm honored to work closely with Mayor Durkin, a true human service champion, on important issues across our city that help to prepare youth for success, support affordability and livability, address homelessness, promote public health, uh, community safety, and promote healthy aging through support services for seniors and people living with disabilities. I am especially grateful for her leadership in increasing and targeting investments through the Human Services Department that help change racial disparities in Seattle and support and lift up Black, Indigenous, and people of color across our city and the region. Mayor Durkin was elected the 56th mayor of Seattle in 2017, becoming the city's first female mayor in nearly a century and only its second openly LGBTQ elected mayor. If we were all able to applaud, I would ask for you to do that now. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Jenny Durkin. And Mayor, my apologies, you're muted. People have been trying to mute me all week. <laughs> uh, 
So thank you, Jason, for the introduction. Thanks to the team. I really um, am very pleased to be here. I'm very sorry that this is virtual. I think one of the hardest thing about this pandemic um, is the way that it has forced so many of us into isolation and broken apart some of those really important civic bonds and, and, and human bonds we have with one another. So know that I am I am drinking my coffee with you, but cannot wait and can actually meet in the same room together. Um, I really want to thank you too, Jason, and your team for all the work you've been doing, not just in the three years that I've been mayor, but during uh, this pandemic and over the last many months. Uh, it has been truly the most difficult time our city has ever faced. You know, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. We were one of the first in the nation to enter it. Um, we had not only no help from our federal government, but they seem to be working against our ability to fight the pandemic. And we took some bold steps early on to stop the spread of the virus because the only thing we could do to stop the spread of the virus was to make sure we didn't have contact with one another. But with that came some significant problems and issues. The first was it has created more and more isolation for people, particularly for those who are seniors. The second is it showed us right away that by shutting down our economy, the, that there was huge economic devastation for people. Both the health impacts and the economic impacts of the pandemic have landed very disproportionately on our communities of color and on our seniors. We have seen that the people who suffered in the earliest days were disproportionately those who were seniors and aging. Um, but as the pandemic continued, we saw that it skewed so that our Latinx community and our black community have been disproportionately impacted by the health impacts. That's true of the economic impacts as well, um, because we were a city that already had such disparity in our access to economic opportunity and the jobs where people could work from home. Um, we saw 55,000 people immediately leave the center core, but many people couldn't work from home because the jobs they had required them to show up. Others were essential workers. And in those groups of people, they were disproportionately people of color and people who were service workers or who are not having the same economic prosperity in our city. So in this backdrop, we saw immediately the disparities we saw before the pandemic were even more stark. And against that backdrop, we then saw George Floyd murder in Minnesota, which ignited a civil rights and racial reckoning in our country. That we are in the midst of that, and it has called me as mayor and our whole city to really acknowledge and recognize the existence of systemic racism and its impact on each of the institutions that we have whether it's policing or education, access to all opportunity. And so in the last months, we have had to change how we govern. Um, most of Seattle workers were working from home. Uh, many who could not work from home um, were in the field, but were vulnerable, were home on COVID uh, relief. And so we have changed how we had to operate. We learned very quickly that the programs we had in place that we thought would build the resilience for our community had not anticipated a crisis of this magnitude or type. For example, we had regularly supported um, uh, our seniors um, and those who were approaching uh, older age, like myself, um, with a whole range of programs, but many of those programs required people coming together, whether it's at senior centers or programming itself. Suddenly those gatherings couldn't happen, but they weren't just gatherings for many people. It was the sole meal that they could have. So we suddenly had to stand up. The ability to deliver meals to people at their homes, to make sure that uh, school children who couldn't go to school also didn't miss their meals and that their families had access to childcare so that their parents, if they had to work, could work. The work of government changed almost overnight. Um, we now are providing grocery vouchers to almost 14,000 families in the city of Seattle. Uh, we have city workers who have helped man food banks. We've had to change the whole way we deliver services to get us through this pandemic because your lives have changed. How you interact with one another, your daily lives, 
your access to everything from medical appointments to meetings with families. Everyone's lives have changed in the last nine months. We will come out of this. It will take some time. Um, best estimates are we will be living with pandemic restrictions at least through the middle of next year, if not through all of next year. That requires us as a society to take a lot of steps that we hadn't anticipated, not just to get through it, but as we get through it and prepare to come out of it, to make sure when we come out of it, we really change structurally those systems that were inequitable so that we can come back stronger, more just, and more equitable. It will take work from all of us. It has been really devastating to so many families and so many people. A record number of people are out of work. Small businesses have closed. Uh, people have lost loved ones. And people have seen the impacts of the racial disparities in such a deep and personal way that has caused pain and trauma, not just in our city, but across the country. Um, and in the end, in, in about a week and a half, we go to the polls and we elect a president. Um, and the national uh, president matters for us in Seattle. Yesterday, we had to file a lawsuit because this president labeled our city an anarchist jurisdiction and has threatened and taken actions to take away all our federal funding. Um, that would be everything from programs that, that age-friendly Seattle relies on to the COVID relief funding to transportation dollars. Uh, we will fight it. I think we will prevail. But it just shows that in this challenging time um, that we must come together to really look forward to not just the city we are today, but the city that we must become as we come out of COVID. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, this is this Anthony is Derrick. Derrick. I'm, I'm the Mayor's Mayor. Digital Advisor, and I'll be moderating today's Q&A. Uh, so thanks again, Mayor, for those really wonderful opening remarks. Uh, as a reminder to everyone who's joining us this morning, if you have a question, please go ahead and enter it into the Q&A. We've got only a few uh, at this point. We'd love to see more, and it would be really great if you could put your name so we can uh, address you by name. Um, so the first question we have this morning is about the city's uh, budget due to the COVID-19 crisis. Mayor, from Teresa, she would like to know, how are you going to balance priorities in the upcoming budget due to the shortfalls uh, that we've seen with COVID-19? And Mayor, don't forget to take yourself off of mute. Thank you, Teresa, for that question. Under the way the city charter works, I was required to deliver my budget about two weeks ago. Um, under our, the state law, our budget has to be balanced. We, ha we can only spend the amounts that we project that we will take in in revenues next year. And so right now we're in the midst of deciding what the budget will be for 2021. Because of the COVID crisis, we had the unusual circumstance that we for 2020 no longer had a balanced budget and were required to do so. We lost about uh, $300 million, between two and $300 million in revenues to the city for 2020. So we had to go back and, um, and make up that gap. The good news was at the outset of the pandemic, because we were one of the first in it, we were able to see immediately the huge economic consequences that we thought it would have. So we took some steps right away to um, freeze hiring, reduce expenses, and we're able to make up um, many millions of dollars in that way. We also were able to get uh, through our delegation, uh, the first law that passed for COVID relief, we were able to insert into that, that cities of a certain size would get direct aid. It would not have to go through the state or the counties. Um, and we in the city of Seattle were one of a handful of cities in the country. So we were able to get immediate COVID relief to help us weather some of the deficits for the great the programming that's so necessary during this time. So as we're looking forward to next year, we have a deficits of the same amounts. And going in, my values and principles were clear. Number one is the essential COVID relief we were giving to, to people and small businesses and individuals. We would try to continue and not cut that programs. We, it's more important than ever to be able to provide some of those safety net programs and programs that give housing stability, food stability, and the like. 
Second, I wanted to make sure that we recognize that what that I believe true community safety comes not from police. It comes from having strong, resilient and vibrant communities. And our communities of color in Seattle have been not just left behind, but left out um, and purposely by some of the institutions that have been designed over generations. We know that we need to, for example, invest more in healthcare, access to employment, access to affordable housing, access to education justice. And by every one of those metrics, our community of color, particularly our black community, indigenous community, falls, have fallen behind. And so I pledge that we would spend at least $100 million in investments like that, but those investments would be guided by community. And so I announced a community task force made up of leaders from throughout the city of Seattle from uh, organizations and individuals very tied to the communities of color and the black community and the indigenous community. They will be doing the community engagement to work with community on determining what are the priorities for those investments. I also have asked a variety of options so that we can make that kind of investment on a long-term basis over 10 years at least. And I think it is through that kind of budgeting that we are in a down cycle. It is the time now to invest in equity because otherwise when we come out of this COVID economic crisis and health crisis, it will take years to recover and it will take even longer if we don't build those building blocks now. So we're investing things also like green and healthy streets. I believe coming out of this, we can come back better for the climate. So we have did a range of priorities to number one, invest in people. Number two, to position us as a city to be more green and more accountable. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, our next question today comes from Joe. And Joe asks, how is the city planning to provide services previously provided by the transition team and the navigation team? Um, Joe notes that the need has not gone away and asks, uh, what do you think we can do at this point to, to address this, this need? So Joe, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, I may have a better answer next week because we've been um, having ongoing discussions and negotiations with the city council on what we could do to replace these resources. Um, I think it's well known now that one of my disagreements with the budget that the city council passed was their elimination of the navigation team, um, including the team at the human services department that um, kept in property and, and did outreach and the like. Um, we have not just the need continues, but the need is growing and we have to have the resources to deal with these issues, the, the huge impacts that um, that some of the encampments have on the people living in the encampments as well as the impacts on community. So we've been working with council. We're hopeful that council will agree to the to the compromise we proposed before, um, which is to continue to fund uh, people in the human services department to oversee uh, increased outreach to those encampments. We will still be working with and discussing with them how we increase the amount of shelter capacity available to bring more people inside and what we can do to accelerate the building of housing itself, including permanent supportive housing. I'm really excited that we have a project coming in line that will be one of the, you know, one of the problems we've had is that each individual unit of affordable housing costs around $325,000 to build. And if it's permanent supportive housing, as much as $20,000 a year for services and maintenance. Um, and it takes about two to three years to build. Uh, we can't scale that as a city to meet the demand. So we have our first project coming in line that is using new building techniques to bring it on less expensively and more quickly. Um, and we're looking at all options across the region to see how we can bring more people inside. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Joe, for that question. Um, our next question is from an anonymous, uh, anonymous question asker. And they would like to know um, what assistance is available for paying property taxes? And they note that um, with the rise of property uh, property values and stagnant incomes, um, they want to know have income requirements been updated or what other assistance could be available. So that's a, a good question, and it was one that had come in uh, earlier this month um, because of when property taxes are due. 
As you know, the, the property taxes themselves are levied at the county level um, by the assessor and the county government and controlled by the state. But we've been working with them to see if there's programs. They delayed the payment of the March payments that were due. And I think there's ongoing discussions for the October payments and when they're due. Um, that would have to be centered at the county. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not yet been a fund created for payment of property taxes. Uh, the governor is working on a, a, a program for mortgage payment, but the issue on property tax is a very good one. If you could email us at jenny.durkin at seattle.gov and remind us, we'll get more information on that and send you a response. Thank you very much, Mayor. Our next question, also from an anonymous question asker. Um, Mayor, with the uh, creation of a regional authority for homelessness in our in our region, how can we better track and share progress to a stated goal regarding our homelessness crisis in our region? So that is, um, that question goes to the core of, I think, why are regional homeless authority so important? Um, I think all of us on this call know that the issues that have uh, related to people living unhoused don't stop at any city border. We have more and more people who've fallen into homelessness despite the fact that we are spending uh, this year alone twice as much as last year and I almost doubled the spending on that before. Um, we had some successes before the pandemic. We were moving um, more people into long-term housing than before. We had shifted our shelter system from mats on the floor to enhanced shelters that really provided uh, more support services available 24 seven and things like that. But it is very uneven. Uh, we have seen that the city of Seattle is shouldering most of the burden, financial burden um, and services burden in King County. Um, only about 50% based on some of the data we've seen of the people that city of Seattle serves, of uh, people experiencing homelessness, actually living in Seattle when they became homeless. A number of those, a significant portion, were living in city, other cities in King County and Washington State. So we have to track as a region and as a state. We need a system that requires every city um, under the Growth Management Act or other tools, not only to have density, but to ensure that they have adequate affordable housing in their communities and adequate services for people experiencing homelessness so that people can be served in the communities that they live. And this will only happen, I believe, through a regional authority and through greater uh, accountability at the state level and tracking. One of the things that we will be doing in the new regional authority is they will be adopting a strategic plan. The public will have input into that that does exactly what you said. What are our goals and how do we track them? How do we hold not just the, uh, the system accountable, but how do we make sure that each part of that system is delivering on what it needs to do to really deal with this very, very difficult issue? Thank you, Mayor. So our next question, another anonymous question. Um, <clears throat> early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, we were uh, lucky enough to experience another crisis that was a bit closer to home. So this is an open-ended question, Mayor, but what are we going to do about the West Seattle Bridge? <laughs> Um, so I was in West Seattle last Friday um, and in Georgetown and South Park uh, talking to people personally. Um, I've been spending a lot of time trying to talk to those communities, but most of it's been virtual uh, and I was able to break out of the virtual boundaries. The impacts of the West Seattle Bridge cannot be overstated on those communities. Um, for West Seattle, it is it is really hurt individuals and businesses. It has cut mobility to essential things like doctor's appointments, um, let alone where people work. For the communities of South Park, it has created other issues. They have more traffic going through their neighborhoods and communities, which has increased their already large environmental burden. And Georgetown and Soto have similar types of experience in terms of traffic patterns and in impacts on the community. So we want to deal with each of these. I will not tell you that you're going to have a solution to West Seattle Bridge this year or next year under any of the alternatives, but we are pushing forward. And my instructions at Seattle Department of Transportation was number one, to take whatever steps we needed to do to make sure that as we evaluated whether we needed to replace or repair, that we didn't exclude either of those options and move forward on both. 
So right now we're shoring up the bridge, which re is required on whatever option we do. We have to shore it up if we repair it, and we have to shore it up if we're going to replace it because otherwise it could collapse, making the replacement a much more difficult long-term problem. We had a, a new alternative, which engineers proposed recently on a rapid replacement that we're evaluating, uh, but there'll be more input by the community this week and next week on to what the cost benefit analysis shows. There was basically three questions. What would it cost? How long would it take? How long would it last? Um, because we don't want to have a, a, a remedy that only lasts two years and then West Seattle's cut off again. So it is an urgent, urgent problem um, and we are going to hopefully get a solution. I'll say one last thing about it is we filed a lawsuit yesterday against the Trump administration, the Department of Justice, because they have created what they call an anarchist jurisdiction list to deny us federal funding and to take federal funding back. That would include transportation dollars that might help on the West Seattle Bridge and Sound Transit. So we one reason that we felt it was urgent to, to take that action, which I think we will prevail on, was to make sure that we don't fall behind on so many of the critical things we need to do and get the federal funding that, that isn't a gift to us. It's been appropriated by Congress and it's taxpayer dollars that people in Seattle have paid. Mayor, you mentioned in the, your answer to that question about the isolating impacts of the West Seattle Bridge being down. Um, we have a question from John, who is an HSD staff person. And his question is, or, or his, he notes that the pandemics uh, dragging on really is creating a social isolation problem, especially for older adults. So what are your thoughts? How can we work together to promote social connectivity, especially for our aging population? That is such a great question. And I think we're getting better at it. Um, look, I think when the pandemic hit, everybody um, went to shelter in place. Um, and there was both a lot of fear and trepidation about what we could do. We didn't know as much about the virus communication and we didn't have platforms like this set up or ways to check in on each other. I think the virus is still as dangerous. Do not listen to anything else. It is still as dangerous and we have to be very careful. Um, Seattle has, through all the work we've done, whether it is people masking up or being socially distanced or being isolated or setting up you know, our testing sites, um, we're, we have some of the lowest rates of any large city in America, but it also is having huge and devastating impacts. Um, one of the impacts that right now I think that has been underappreciated that our government is going to be working with the state and hopefully the federal government on is those mental health impacts that we're seeing across the board, um, particularly for our aging population, but for everyone else. I recently talked to uh, uh, a number of the companies in Seattle, large and small, and asked them about what their concerns were in the next year. And surprisingly, um, all of them have business concerns. All of them are worried about whether they will continue to employ the people that they have and how their employees will make it through it. But to a person, they're worried about the mental health impacts that this isolation has had on everyone. And I think it is even more so um, on our senior and aging population. So it's one of the things that Jason and I have talked about and how we in the city of Seattle can start again reconfiguring. And frankly, again, we got to learn from community. So if you all have ideas on things you wish you had had over these last five months, whether it's from your community or your government, a way to check in on friends, a way to check in on your church, whatever it is that would make you feel more connected, because unfortunately we'll be living with this for a while longer. You know, we would love to hear your ideas and be able to empower your ideas, because if you're feeling it, I can guarantee you many, many people are feeling the same thing. So I think if we work together and really try to reconnect ourselves, um, we can deal with some of those issues of isolation, but it has to be super intentional. Um, because we're going into winter and winter's already hard in Seattle. Uh, Mayor, with that question, it, it seemed as though there may be some thought about this already, um, but a question from Brent. What would you like to see Age-Friendly Seattle focus on in 2021? So I think Age-Friendly Seattle can continue to help us on what we do in this pandemic for the question that was just asked and what are those things now that we know are more of a rhythm 
have been the hardest to deal with and what are some of the fix we can get to people, whether it's for food security or social interactions, medical appointments. What are those things we can do through this pandemic to, to really get people through it? But also, you know, the, the issues we had related to age-friendly Seattle didn't disappear with the pandemic. They only got more aggravated. So what are the things we also need to do, the building blocks we have to build so that as we come out of COVID, we actually are better than when we went into it. And I think that that is one of the true opportunities we have here. This has been the most challenging thing that's happened to every individual and every organization. Um, and But with that comes huge opportunity to really reset how we do a lot of things and to really focus on what matters. And what we've seen through this pandemic is People have, have have really had to focus on what was most important to them and what mattered most in their life. Um, and I think if we take those lessons and amplify them, we can come out of this better and stronger. Thank you, Mayor. We're shifting uh, focus here just a little bit with our next question, an anonymous question asker. Um, is the city able to convert unused public property into housing? Um, if it's mixed market rate and low income, would it not be self-supporting? The answer is yes, and we are. Um, it's actually one of the really exciting things that we had started to move the needle on before the pandemic come, and our Office of Housing is continuing to move that needle. Um, I, I worked with uh, Representative Frank Chop, who has a deep, deep history in affordable housing and was Speaker of the House at the time to pass a law that allowed the city to use its surplus properties for affordable housing. Um, before that, the law required us to actually buy it from the city to use for affordable housing, which um, is counterintuitive. And so we have a number, of, a number of projects underway where we are using surplus property or property that the city owned for affordable housing and actually using them in some cases for not just affordable housing rentals, but home ownership opportunities in units that will be permanently affordable. We're doing that um, in North Seattle. We're going to be doing that uh, in the area around Discovery Park. We also have some projects coming along in South Seattle. Yesterday also, I was very proud uh, as a board member of Sound Transit. We've been working for about a year and a half to get Sound Transit to give us their surplus property in and around their station so we could use it for affordable housing. And yesterday, the Sound Transit board authorize that transfer. So we will have new parcels in South Seattle that we've already slotted in to build those kind of affordable housing opportunities, including some that will be permanently affordable home ownership opportunities. So I think it's a really exciting program and one that we're going to be looking for more opportunities to do just that, to put our land to work to address one of the biggest issues we have. Great. Speaking of exciting programs and uh, really revolutionary ideas, we have a question from an anonymous asker to talk more about our safe and healthy streets program and how we're thinking about making that permanent uh, and what you think it, it could do to benefit older persons and people living with disabilities. So I think this is also one of the silver linings for the pandemic it, because uh, people were staying home um, and we had so fewer people on the streets, it allowed us to turn those streets into places that could be open for people to socially distance, but get outside. Uh, when we first started it, uh, I had been, I'm really one of the fortunate things I'm able to do is I had been elected right before the pandemic hit to the governing board for the Mayor's C40 conference, which is a global conference of mayors on the issue of climate change. And in that, once COVID hit, I was also then elected to the COVID relief group for the global work of mayors. Um, I was able to talk to Mayor Hidalgo and some of the other mayors who have who just designed what they called the 10 minute city. How do you de design a city that people can get what they need within 10 minutes of walking or biking from their home? And this kind of future that we have for a mixed mobility and to reduce our reliance on vehicles. So our Seattle Department of Transportation, I really, my, my hat off to Sam Zimbabwe and his team um, and to a person named Elliot, who's on my staff, 
who I said, let's do it. Let's ourselves open as many streets as possible and get people the ability to go out, to walk, to bike, to feel safe. Um, and it has been hugely successful. Our second phase was to then take back some of our sidewalks and streets to allow restaurants to operate because being outside is so much safer in the time of COVID. And that too has been very successful. It's gonna be trickier here in the rain. So I think we wanna hang on to as many of those healthy streets as possible and really be thinking about how we build that into our city going forward. Because I do believe um, for all of us, but particularly for, for the age-friendly agenda that we have, having that kind of open space and capability to have mobility that is safe um, is really important. There is a challenge, um, and that is that there, particularly when we have restaurants on sidewalks, that that creates mobility issues for people living with disabilities. And so we, one reason for the open streets is to also give place and access for those and also be able to use the sidewalk spaces for restaurants. So we're balancing those things together, but I think it's, you know, if you haven't been out in your neighborhood um, and walking on some of your open streets, do it. It's it's really, you see people out, but you feel safe because you're distance. You're hopefully wearing your mask every time. Um, and even in these wintry days, there's always those um, breaks where the rain stops and it's good to get outside. Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and so far on today's call, we've had some questions about homelessness, about our infrastructure, um, about what we're gonna do to, to help get more of our, our community inside. But now we're gonna go to a really tough question from Sarah. Pickleball is a wonderful sport for seniors. In spite of being the birth of pickle, birthplace of pickleball, Seattle has no dedicated courts and limited spaces to play. Uh, Mayor, how can we get more pickleball in Seattle? You know, that that is the first time in three years anyone's asked me about pickleball. I love it. Um, I will talk to our parks people. I will tell you I'm not good at pickleball. Um, I hit it too far and too hard, which probably is not a surprise to anybody, and have a hard time staying in the court. Um, but it is a great game, and it's uh, let's find out about it, whether we can have some pop-up pickleball courts. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we are reaching the end of the questions we have published today, so I'm going to encourage more people to send. We have about five to ten more minutes to ask a few more questions. Um, uh, I see another one popping up. Thank you so much for submitting that. Mayor, this question is from an anonymous asker. What do you think it will take for folks to regain trust in government at every level, the local, state, and especially the national level? Um, I think I think it's going to be hard. Um, first, I think the national government, uh, that regaining trust um, means that you have a government that's actually working for the people. And we haven't seen that in the last four years, I think, in my personal view. And so I think that having a government that is focused not on sowing division, but on bringing people and uniting us on our common aspirations, our common dreams, and our common goals for our country is what needs to happen. At the local level, I think that trust is built um, in a number of ways, but I think one of the things that is always causes distrust is when people view their government as separate from themselves, rather than an extension of themselves and the democratic will. I think that we will never be in a place in this region um, for, for a period of time that <clears throat> any of the problems and challenges we have will be fixed by government. Um, it's gonna take all of us and it's gonna take individual action. And for us to have trust in government, we have to have trust in each other and trust in our abilities to work together to solve big challenges. And one of the things that's been very difficult, I think, particularly over the last four years is that trust in each other, that trust to come together to, to, to address those mutual challenges has been greatly diminished because of the hard divisive lines that have been drawn. Um, I think that we've done pretty well in Seattle on that front where we have tackled big problems, but the last year it's been more difficult. Um, and so I think that we have to get back to a place where um, one, government has to reflect and listen to the community and, and the values that it serves. And two, it really is not something separate from the people. Um, ultimately, the most good that's done in any community, I believe, comes from the community and is done by the community. 
And then it is that shared work together that really moves a society forward. So I think that trust gets restored when we can start, I think, again, to be in rooms together, to build trust together, and to find those things that there really is common aspirations um, to meet the common challenges. Thank you, Mayor. Um, question from uh, an anonymous question asker. Uh, feels It sometimes feels like aging population is left out of city planning. Uh, the example that they give is um, SDOT and a focus on bike lanes. Um, you can reply directly to that, Mayor, but I think it would be nice for to hear more generally on um, what you think the, the city can do to make the aging population feel as though it is brought into these conversations and that uh, we are looking out for them when we make decisions. So I, I think that it is true to a certain extent. Um, and you know, it was, I think, a difficult thing for the city. The city grew so rapidly, and much of the growth and much of the planning was done to serve the folks who were adding to the growth. So it was the people moving here for the new jobs and the new companies that were being created, and it was stimulating all this growth. But at the same time, the population, the aging population who'd been living here, who moved here, um, had different needs, uh, everything from mobility to services. And so working with Jason's team, we've been really trying to focus on what are those things that we know were problems. Take the issue of mobility. Um, we've spent a lot of time and money working on, you know, building out more transit. And we, before the pandemic, had done a really remarkable job in our city and our region. We were one of the only large cities in America where transit use was increasing, not decreasing. But that transit isn't always friendly to the aging population, both because of the accessibility of buses, where the routes were, whether you could get to the routes. And it was one of the reasons why we started the pilots that we called VIA, where we were people could get that last mile and actually have like a shuttle bus come pick them up and take them to either medical appointments or to transit hubs. Um, we need to continue to look at how we do that. We also did a thing where we looked at each of our senior centers in the city of Seattle and looked at it through the lens of the aging population that may be traveling to and from those senior centers and what were the obstacles, whether it was crosswalk um, signs that didn't give people enough time to get across the street. And so it was dangerous. Uh, whether it was uh, making sure that there was ramps so people had accessibility if they had limited mobility. We also know that from what's happened in the pandemic that the services we have for an aging population aren't meeting what we need. While we have a lot of great programs, um, it is they are not always accessible to people with different languages or different abilities, and they haven't really been informed by the population itself. So again, it's a time where we need to learn more as we are an aging population, I'm an aging population. And what are the things that we know we need today and are going to be needing in the next 20 years, particularly as our boomer uh, generation ages? Um, and how do we prepare for that in a way that allows people to have uh, access to this great city and to the great programming and, and events in the city once we can finally get out of our Zoom calls? That's great, Mayor. And, and speaking of plans and, and the needs of community. We have another question from an anonymous question asker um, who wants to hear a little bit more about your plans and your views um, to reimagine the Seattle Police Department. Uh, they mention that uh, the call, of course, is to cut police funding by 50 percent, but they want to know um, how we balance that demand and work to keep people safe. So thanks for that question. And I think this is a question that um, we will be having some deep discussions in the coming months throughout the city of Seattle. We'll be setting up um, coffee hours and town halls to get people's input on exactly those questions so we know where everyone in Seattle is on some of these issues. My view um, and, and the vision that I have now after listening to people, but also having worked in and around the criminal legal system um, and community organizations for over 40 years, is that we can we need to reimagine what policing does policing has changed over the last 10 and 20 years we're now police um, are called to address many situations and many events that before would have been handled differently by our society 
Um, and I think if you put police officers at one table and community members at another table and said, what are three things that police do today that you'd rather have somebody else do or would be better to have somebody else do, those lists would be very similar. Give you an example, um, mental health crisis and people in uh, uh, substance disorder crisis. It is a growing issue um, in every city in America. We went from a promise in the 1980s from deinstitutionalization of people who had uh, mental health or other challenges to a promise of community-based services. Those community-based services never really materialized at a scale to meet the need of people. And so today, uh, for example, last year, the Seattle Police Department responded to almost 17,000 crisis calls. 17,000 times police officers with guns were responding to people who were in crisis, mental health crisis, substance abuse crisis. Um, we did a lot of work at the Seattle Police Department to equip them to deal with those calls, crisis intervention training, connections with social workers at every precinct, uh, more crisis intervention specialists. And as a result, those calls, unlike when I investigated the Seattle Police Department as US attorney, resulted in a minimal use of force. But it still left the police with very few options because once the police intervene, they have a choice of either taking that person in crisis if they've committed a crime to jail where there is no treatment, um, or if they have not committed a crime, maybe to Harborview Hospital uh, where there's limited ability to have treatment. We need a different system to deal with those issues. Seattle can't do that alone. That has got to be state and federally supported and it has to be regional so that we have a different system in place so that if someone is in crisis, we can respond to that person. Better yet, have the resources to support that person so they're not in crisis on our downtown streets. We started a pilot called Health One because when I came in, one of the things I looked at is where are our police responding today? Where are our top calls? So that we can evaluate how do we better tool our police department? I, I will admit, I was surprised the top five places where police were called, the majority of them were our shelters, some of our larger shelters, that the police were responding and fire were responding because people were in crisis um, and committing sometimes acts of violence. It makes no sense to have that as the front response. So we created a, a program called Health One, which is a trained medic and a social worker, kind of like uh, Medic One was for heart attacks. We thought this could be the solution for some of the low acuity calls. Um, and instead of police responding to one of those calls, Health One can respond. They can take the time, instead of just either taking someone to jail or the hospital, they can find out what they need. Are they off their medications? Do they need their medications? Do they have a caseworker they need? Is there family? Do they need to go to the hospital? It's been enormously successful and we're now, hopefully if my budget's adopted, we will scale that program to add more. Um, but it also takes resources, time, and training. And so as we reimagine policing, we have to have something to fill those vacuums and build those community-based solutions. The other thing we have to do is we have to go upstream because the true, true, true solution for community safety is healthy and resilient communities. To invest in things like affordable housing, access to health care, uh, child care, pre-K, a true educational justice and economic opportunity. If a community is healthy, the need for police is less. So we have to work on every front. We have to reimagine what the police are doing and how they do it. We have to build a community-based response and we have to invest in those communities who have been left behind, particularly our black, indigenous, and people of color communities. And if we do that over time, I think we can see significant changes. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, we are reaching the end of our time here with Q&A. So uh, I wanna say thank you, Mayor. I wanna say thank you to everybody who submitted a question. We have lots of really great questions that just came into the chat and it's unfortunate that we, we can't get to them all. Um, but I think uh, the best thing to do at this point would be to, to put a pin in it, Mayor. If you wanna say anything else about our uh, plan for reopening, uh, leave uh, with some thoughts on, on what you envision the city to look like in the future um, as, we, as we come out of this COVID-19 crisis. So I, it's a, let me tell you a little bit about what my vision was before the pandemic hit, because it still guides 
what my vision is, though it is going to be more challenging for us. When I came in as mayor, in some ways, Seattle was the envy of all of America. We had some of the um, highest number of technology jobs. Some of the greatest companies in the world were founded here and started here and thrived here. We, had, uh, we were the fastest growing city in America with the highest wages paid in almost any city in America but two. At the same time, that prosperity was not being shared. Um, we were in the midst of what I described then as a time that was more transformative than the Industrial Revolution, where the technology and innovation economy was quickly displacing the other economy without having the ladders and access from the prior economy to the new economy. And clearly the people being left behind were the mostly our communities of color. And you could almost draw a line north to south in Seattle and see the stark differences. Um, and so we worked really hard to say, how do we build that bridge to the new economy? It's one reason why having free college was so important to me as mayor and in instituting that program so that every kid in Seattle would have that opportunity to get a leg up and then to pair that with internships and jobs paid for so that people had access. But that is only if you graduate from college. So we also had to work, how do we help the Seattle Public Schools to really close the opportunity gap, particularly for our students of color? And how do we get quality pre-K so kids are showing up ready to learn in kindergarten? We started those programs as well as announcing uh, unprecedented amounts of affordable housing, $1.5 billion in affordable housing. I've had the great honor to announce as being mayor. And new investments in things like Africatown, the Ethiopian Community Center, the Filipino Community Center, trying to build that community resilience. Um, but then the pandemic hit and what it showed just even more starkly were those disparities. Um, and I think that it has made our obligation even greater to move and to acknowledge the roots of those disparities, the systemic racism over generations, that the solutions have to be community-based and that we have to intentionally and purposely really open up that opportunity and promise so that Seattle continues to be an innovative city, a city with a great uh, diversity and immigrant and refugee population, a city uh, that is growing and new and uh, open and welcoming, a city that is the hub to great innovation, whether the innovation is an art or technology, but that will only happen in, if we can make it inclusive. And it's going to be hard. Coming out of this pandemic is going to be really hard for every city in America, including the city of Seattle. We will be in some kind of COVID restrictions probably through next year. Our largest employers have already said that they will not be returning to our downtown through at least the middle of next year, some even longer. So all of those people who are coming into our city and providing the backdrop for restaurants and small businesses and our brick and mortar businesses, they're not there anymore. And so we've got a plan. We have to have a plan that is just and equitable, but that is very intentional because every city, not just in America, but every city across the globe is gonna be coming out of COVID about the same time. And every one of them is gonna have the same aspirations that we have in Seattle. And that is to build back an economy, to make sure that people aren't employed, that small businesses can thrive, that communities of color are lifted up. And in many ways, we're gonna be very, we're gonna be competing for those jobs that are the jobs of the future and that will help us keep the jobs of the present. And so the only way we can do it is if we have those shared aspirations and work together because it will be challenging and it will take it will take grit. But this city has done it before and I believe we will do it again. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and that concludes our, our Q&A portion, so I will hand it back over to Lenny to close us out. Thank you, Derek. Uh, thank you, Mayor Durkin, for uh, stopping by the coffee hour. We hope that you will uh, visit with us again, uh, hopefully when we've reopened, and uh, it will be an in-person kind of a uh, meeting with real coffee and maybe donuts. Um, 
Thank you also to everyone who joined us today. Um, we appreciate you having a, a virtual cup of coffee with us. If we didn't get to your question, uh, or if you have additional questions for the mayor's office, you can direct them to jenny.durkin at seattle.gov, or feel free to, to leave a comment under this video once it's posted on YouTube. Our channel is called Aging King County. You can search for that on YouTube. And we do invite you to subscribe and enable notifications so that you are the first to know when this and other content is uploaded. For the remainder of 2020, we are live most Thursdays at 1030 AM and at other times for special events like today's coffee hour and next Friday at 2 PM for a panel on vaccine trial participation in the LGBTQ and Two-Spirit BIPOC community. All are accessible at the same URL you found us today, which is bit.ly forward slash age friendly live. There are no spaces, but all words are capitalized. And with any aging or disability question or concern, we do encourage you to contact Community Living Connections, a countywide network of community organizations that can connect you with services and resources such as food, meals, transportation, and housing options, and more. Information and referrals are professional, confidential, and most services are free of charge. Call them toll free at 1 844 348 5464 or go, go to communitylivingconnections.org to see the list of participating organizations in this network. Thank you again to Mayor Jenny Durkin, to the Seattle Public Library, and to our viewers. Have a great day.